Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from a civil service examination perspective. Today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Daily Edition dated 2nd May 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on the screen and a timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. So our first topic in this regard is Melanistic Tiger Dies in Similipa Tiger Reserve. This topic has appeared at page number 4 in today's The Hindu Daily Edition. This topic is mainly relevant from the prelims examinations perspective because in prelims we will see that almost every year certain questions are asked from the Tiger Reserve, National Parks, Biosphere Reserves etc. So therefore from prelims perspective we will be dealing with certain key facts related to this particular Tiger Reserve. The immediate context in which this news article has appeared is that a melanistic tiger was found dead in the core area of Simlipal Tiger Reserve. Now the forest department has said that the clash within the male tiger's population in order to have a dominance over their own territory led to the death of this tiger. However, this loss is very important. The reason being that Similipa Tiger Reserve was the only area in the world where it was having this melanistic tiger. And in this very regard, a team of National Tiger Conservation Authority is going to investigate the circumstances under which this happened. Now when we look at the previous year questions, for example here two sample questions have been taken from the year 2020 and 2017. Have a close look on both these questions. The 2020 question said that among the following tiger reserves, which one has the largest area under the critical tiger habitat? In 2017, the question asked, from the ecological point of view, which one of the following assumes importance in being a good link between Eastern Ghats and Western Ghats? So basically, if you decode both these questions, you will see that in 2017, the physiographic aspects of these important protected areas are asked. So basically, you need to understand that what are various physiographic aspects of any particular protected area. Similarly, in 2020, the key fact related to the boundaries of protected areas, for example, critical tiger habitat was asked. So in this relation, you should understand that what do you mean by critical tiger habitat? So basically, both these questions tell us that Whenever you are preparing national parks, biosphere reserves, etc., you need to prepare them holistically. And therefore, in today's lesson, we are going to cover one such tiger reserve that is Simli Park National Park and Tiger Reserve. Now, this is a rough map. Basically, this map is of the state of Odisha. And you will see that Simli Park National Park and Tiger Reserve is located in the northern part of the state of Odisha. So now let us come towards these key facts. Basically the Simli Pal is Tiger Reserve, it is also a National Park and it is also a Biosphere Reserve. We all know that within one Biosphere Reserve there can be more than one Tiger Reserve as well as National Parks. This Simli Pal, this name is derived from the Semul trees which are the silk cotton trees found in this particular forest. So on the basis of this simul, this name is Similipal. This biosphere reserve has the largest zone of sal trees in India. As far as the biogeographic zones are concerned, this tiger reserve comes under the Deccan Peninsular Biogeographic Zone. It is basically in the southeastern part of Deccan Plateau, Chota Nagpur province and Mahanadian region. So this is also important. As far as the flora is concerned, it harbors a unique blend of Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats as well as sub-Himalayan plant species. So basically it has the species of sub-Himalayan, Eastern as well as Western Ghats. Now this point is also very important. As far as the natural vegetation is concerned, it is predominantly moist mixed forests but it also has tropical semi-evergreen forest species. Further, in certain areas, in certain dry isolated patches, we can also find dry deciduous forests as well as grasslands. 
So basically it has moist mixed deciduous forests, tropical semi evergreen forests, dry deciduous forests as well as patches of grasslands. It forms the largest watershed of northern Odisha and also it holds the highest tiger population in Odisha and harbors the only population of melanistic tigers in the world. Now this key fact is unique to the Similipal Tiger Reserve and that is why it is very very important when it comes to the prelims examination. Now melanistic tigers. What are these melanistic tigers? As you can see in the picture, these melanistic tigers have darker patches of black strips on their body. Basically, these are the outcomes of the genetic mutations and some scientists believe that this has happened in Simili Tiger Reserve because of the inbreeding among the tiger population within that area. As far as the tribal communities are concerned, Simlipar forest is home to variety of tribes like Kola, Santhal, Bhumija, Bhatudi, Gondas, Khadias, this tribe Mankidias or Mankadias are very important and then Saharas. In this relation we shall also look at one of the most important statutory body that is National Tiger Conservation Authority because this body is also there in the context. NTCA basically is a statutory body which was constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 for the tiger conservation and this authority is headed by Environment Minister. The objectives of this body is one, provide the statutory authority for the project tiger. Now this project tiger was started we all know in 1972 for the conservation of tigers. Further because we know that tigers are one of the top predators of any ecosystem. So it is believed that if we are able to conserve the top predators, it can bring a beneficial outcome for the overall ecosystem also. The second objective is fostering the accountability of the center as well as state governments in the management of tiger reserves. Third, providing for an oversight by the parliament. Next, Addressing the livelihood interest. Now this is important because it might happen that while attempting the prelims question, you might restrict the NTCA as only the Tiger Conservation Authority. It also deals with the livelihood interests of the local people in areas surrounding the tiger reserves. Its functions are to assist in population assessments of tigers, law enforcement, wildlife forensics, Infrastructural development, again important one, mitigation, smart patrolling and advisory role in the policy formulation. So these are the certain key facts related to National Tiger Conservation Authority. These were the key facts in relation to the Simli Park National Park or Biosphere Reserve. So this was all in relation to today's topic. In similar line, we shall now discuss our second topic. Now this topic is in relation to the Pabitora Wildlife Sanctuary. This topic has appeared at page number 3. Now in a newspaper there is no news regarding it but this image has been shown with a subheading a one horned rhino and a water buffalo with their calves at Pabitora Wildlife Sanctuary in Assam. So now because it has appeared in today's The Hindu Delhi edition and is also one of the most important protected areas in the context of India as well as one horned rhinoceros. So in today's discussion we shall look at certain key facts related to the Pobitora wildlife century, one horned rhinos as well as water buffaloes because this topic can be very important for the upcoming prelims exam. So first let us look at the Pobitora wildlife century and before looking at the key facts let us look at the location of Pobitora. Now this is basically the state of Assam and here we have Pobitora Wildlife Century. This is also a national park and in Assam there are other important protected areas also. For example, Debru Shaikhova, Kaziranga, Orang, Manas, Diporbil and Nameri. So these are some important protected areas of Assam. Coming back to the Pobitora Wildlife Century. There are certain key facts related to its physiography, its flora as well as fauna. One, 
This region is dominated by alluvial lowlands and marshlands because of the presence of the river Brahmaputra. Now because at this region Brahmaputra enters into a mature stage and therefore there are lots of meandering also and there is a fertile alluvial soil presence over there. Further, because these soils have high porosity, so they also have higher water content and the water logging also appears therefore generating the marshland in these areas. This Pobitora wildlife sanctuary is also known as Mini Kaziranga. The reason being Kaziranga National Park is mainly famous for one horned rhinoceros. And as far as the concentration of one horned rhinos are concerned, after Kaziranga, it is the Pabitora wildlife sanctuary where the second largest concentration of one horned rhino exists. Apart from rhinos, other animals are also there, for example, leopards, wild boars, wild buffaloes, as well as barking deers. It is comparatively smaller in size when compared to the other protected areas in Assam. And because of its smaller size and higher concentration, it has the highest population density of Indian rhino anywhere in the world. But this protected area is marred by an invasive aquatic plant known as water hyacinth. And this has become a major problem because it is an invasive species and is threatening the natural ecosystem of that area. So these are certain key facts related to Pobitora wildlife sanctuary. Now we shall also look at the key facts related to the Asian water buffalo. Now this picture is of Asian water buffalo. Its IUCN status is endangered. It is listed under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and it is legally protected in Bhutan, India, Nepal and Thailand. As far as the sites is concerned, it is there in Appendix 3. So these Asian water buffalo, the natural habitat of them includes the tropical and subtropical forests as well as grasslands. They are considered to be terrestrial but are heavily dependent on water and therefore spend majority of their time in the rivers or the mud holes. They are found in wet habitats ranging from riverine forests, grasslands, marshes as well as swamps. They require abundant food and therefore dense cover of forests. Now we shall look at certain key facts of Indian rhinos. First of all, if you closely look at this global distribution of rhinoceros species, you will see that there are around 5 to 6 species of rhinos which are distributed in different regions of the world. For example, if we have to talk about India, in India we all know that we have greater one horned rhinoceros. In Africa, we have the presence of black rhinos. As well as in certain patches, we also have the presence of southern white rhinos. Then comes the Southeast Asian region, whereby the Sumatran rhino and Java rhinos are there. So now we will look at the IUCN conservation level of these species. So all these five species are placed in different categories when it comes to the red list of IUCN. For example, the IUCN status of Indian or Great One Horned Rhino is vulnerable. Further, if we talk about the Wildlife Protection Act, then the species is listed under Schedule 1. Sumatran Rhino is placed in the category of Critically Endangered Species. Similarly, Javan Rhino is also critically endangered and Black Rhino is also critically endangered. But when it comes to the White Rhino, these species are nearly threatened. That means the severity of the decreasing population is far lesser compared to the other four species. Now in the Indian context, we also must understand that what are the essential conditions for the favorable habitat for the greater one horned rhino. So when it comes to the natural habitat, the grasslands and the wetlands are the most favorable area for these species. That is why they are located in the foothills of Himalayas, Ganga and Brahmaputra valleys. In certain patches, they are also present in Indo-Nepal Terai region, northern parts of West Bengal as well as Assam. 
However, formerly they had an extensive distribution over the entire plains of Brahmaputra as well as Ganga. So these were the certain key facts related to various species of rhinos and more precisely for the Indian rhinos. This topic has appeared at page number 4. The topic reads, 5 member SIT to look into 11 deaths due to gas leak in Ludhiana. Now, despite the fact that this topic is very localized in nature because the news is restricted to the district of Ludhiana and the state of Punjab. However, the issue is important. And how do we link it with the UPSC scheme of syllabus? We can link it with the disaster management part given in General Studies Mains Paper 3 in the section of disaster management in UPSC. Because disasters, when we have to divide, they are both natural as well as man-made. And under these man-made disasters, industrial disasters are also very important. You must have not forgotten about the Bhopal gas tragedy. So in this relation, we should understand that what exactly are the industrial disasters and all the important associated dimensions with it. As far as the context of this very news article is concerned, the news says that the gas leak in incident has killed 11 people because they inhaled the toxic gases. This incident has occurred in the densely populated area in the Punjab's industrial hub. So in this regard, we shall now understand the important dimensions associated with industrial disasters. So the first question is that what exactly are the industrial disasters? These are the disasters originating from technological or industrial accidents, dangerous procedures, infrastructure, failure or certain human activities which may cause the loss of life, injury, property damage, socio-economic disruptions or even the environmental degradation. So this is the definition of the industrial disasters. For example, when we think about the 1984 gas tragedy, the Bhopal gas tragedy, that was one of the classic example of the industrial disasters. Similarly, the today's news item, this is also an example of the industrial disasters. Industrial disasters therefore include, for example, accident release of toxic chemicals or gases. As we all know that there are several procedures within the industry where the processes or the chemical reactions which take place in the industry, there are high chances that the toxic gases from those chemical reactions might get released due to human negligence or due to failed chemical reactions. Similarly, industrial explosions also are the type of industrial disasters. These explosions can be as a result of some chemical reactions, they can be nuclear explosions or they can be mining related explosions. All these explosions are also the industrial disasters because obviously these explosions have huge potential to cause a loss of life, property or damage the social economic disruptions. Similarly, now this point is very important, the environmental pollution that might be caused due to industrial waste, chemical or biological waste generating out of the industries. These pollution are also the form of industrial disaster. So whenever you are writing your answer in your mains examination or whenever you have to brainstorm about the industrial disasters, keep this point in mind that pollution caused due to industries are also one of the disasters. This will help you to have a broader outlook to understand the concept of disasters. For example, the water pollution. Similarly, the groundwater pollution. Don't you think that water, soil or environmental pollution, all these pollutions also have the potential to cause the loss of life as well as property? So keep this thing in mind. And similarly, the related aspect is also the acid rain. So these are various types of industrial disasters and when we have to talk particularly about India, we know that India faces several issues of high population load, low industrial regulation, high mismanagement of the industrial resources. So all these factors make India highly vulnerable to these industrial disasters. 
and therefore we must also be aware about the facts related to the industrial disaster management so that is why now we will discuss the approach to handle these industrial disasters so first is the prevention angle obviously prevention is better than cure so whenever we have to manage any disasters the first and the foremost thing which should be in our mind is that somehow we can prevent that disaster to occur and that is why detection of the disasters and characterization of those disasters that what is the type of that disaster what is the vulnerability degree of that disaster what is the scale of that disaster etc becomes important and hence detection and characterization of those disasters further help us to develop the early warning system this early warning system help the people management administration to have certain informations before the disasters hit them and this early warning system help the management to build a robust risk management framework so if we are able to detect characterize the disasters develop the early warning system in order to strengthen the risk management framework we can say that we are in a better position to prevent that disasters to take place however we need to be prepared for the worst also and that is why the second component comes at the preparedness level and for this the capacity development of the human resources is the critical point these human resources can be in house that is within the industries as well as the out of the house that is for example let's say state disaster response forces which are outside the industrial establishments similarly ndrf that is national disaster response forces the district administration the law enforcing agencies etc for this capacity development we must focus on continuous education training knowledge management as well as community awareness next important step is the infrastructural development the basic infrastructure institutions networking and communication medical infrastructure etc must be resilient enough so that it can withstand the shocks created by this industrial disasters let us take a very small example if a particular industry is hit by some disaster so the foremost thing which gets hit is the networking and communication and when the communication lines are disturbed it becomes very difficult to transmit the messages or to establish the communication with the people who are caught within the industries and the people who are outside the industries and working as the rescue team so that is why the networking and communication lines must be resilient enough then comes the response relief and rehabilitation the evacuation infrastructures must also be resilient enough in order to minimize the casualty as well as to mitigate the distress effects of these disasters now the post disaster documentation now this step is very important always keep this thing in your mind whenever you are writing your main answer in relation to the disaster management there is a general tendency that we restrict ourselves to the prevention mitigation and adaptation components however we tend to forget writing about the points which are in the post disaster scenario and this post disaster documentation is an important step because it will eventually help to prevent the disasters which will hit later on that is why proper documentation and categorization of disasters along with the lessons learned must be disseminated to prevent the similar issues in future so these are certain approaches to handle the industrial disasters and will help you in order to write beautiful answers in your mains examination this has appeared at page number 11 again relevant from the prelims examinations perspective in the section of international relations the topic reads india leads in the laundering russian oil and selling to the europe a report has said and this is the very context of this article so in this article two important groupings have been named formal or informal groupings but those names are important because they can be asked as it is in the prelims examination first is the laundromat 
Now this laundromat is basically a grouping of five countries that is India, China, Turkey, UAE and Singapore. First let us understand that what is the whole issue. As we are all aware that there is a Russia-Ukraine war which is still going on and in this war Russia was termed as aggressor by the European countries as well as US. So because Russia was the aggressor and it entered Ukraine so therefore several NATO countries, EU countries, US etc they try to impose sanctions on Russia and hence they form the part of the price cap coalition. Now this price cap coalition has members 1. Australia, Canada, EU, Japan, UK and US. Basically in order to sanction Russia they have set price caps for Russian diesel and other refined petroleum products. That was done basically to impose sanctions on Russia and these countries will not buy Russian petroleum or Russian crude beyond that prices or beyond that limit. But then this sanction was imposed on Russia. Further, these price cap coalition also bar the trade and insurance for any oil purchased above a certain price from Russia. However, it has been reported in this particular report that there are certain countries like India, China, Turkey, UAE and Singapore which are importing the Russian oil and then processing it and then exporting various petroleum based products to the European countries. And that is how these countries which are of the price cap coalition grouping have increased the imports of refined oil products from these countries. As we know that India, China and all these countries are the largest importers of the Russian crude. And that is why this has acted as a major loophole which is which has gone against the sanction policies of these countries against Russia. So from examination's perspective, two important things are to be remembered. One, what is price cap coalition and which are the countries under this coalition grouping? Second, what do we understand by the term laundromat and which are those countries which are the part of laundromat? This topic has appeared at page number 12. This topic is very short but important from the prelims perspective. The topic reads Inaugural ASEAN India Maritime Exercise in South China Sea from today. So in prelims examination the questions related to the bilateral cooperation for example certain agreements, certain conventions as well as the military exercises these become important. The questions can be asked in the form of match the columns or they can also be asked in the form of straightforward questions like factual questions that so and so exercises is between which of the following countries. So in this regard we shall keep this discussion very brief. The context says that in a step further in the expanding India ASEAN relationship a military cooperation is also being strengthened and the maiden that is for the first time ASEAN India Maritime Exercise and the acronym for this is AIM, ASEAN India Maritime Exercise is set to begin. So basically this AIM exercise is very important between India as well as ASEAN group of countries and this is basically a maritime exercise. In this relation there are other two important things. One is the IDMAX 23 which is the International Maritime Defense Exhibition. And second is IMSC which is the International Maritime Security Conference. So India will also be taking part in IDMAX as well as IMSC which is being hosted by Singapore. Again a factual information. It was basically started in 1997 and with these conference and the real time discussions the maritime security in the overall Asian region is going to be strengthened.